So welcome everybody to a, another um, painting art tutorial. This one is going to be a watercolor tutorial. Uh, this is number 80, I believe. Um, I've developed kind of a weird numbering system where I'll have drawings and I'll do a part one, part two, analysis, time lapse, um, stuff where it'll be kind of a numbered, but it'll be a trailer for a Patreon exclusive one. Um, so it's kind of just a weird numbering system taking place, but for, uh, just systematic sake, we are number 80 and I believe before this whole global crisis thing, such out down work, I was in the high forties. So I've done <laughs> at least 30 videos within, uh, I guess, three weeks. So I've been putting a lot of content out there. And it's fun. I enjoy um, filming these, and people seem to be enjoying them. Getting a lot of great comment in the uh, feedback sections of uh, YouTube. And I really appreciate you guys who comment and ask questions or ask me to um, clarify stuff. So... I try to respond to all y'all, and I really appreciate you guys and your feedback and your interactions. Um, speaking of all that stuff, just to get it out of the way, um, I try to provide a lot of free YouTube videos, and if you don't, if you want to, there's no obligation. Obviously, um, there's a link down below uh, for my Patreon account, and I would love for you guys to be a supporter. That will help me, um, you know, purchase paint materials and whatnot and I have like two really cheap tiers one of them's like three dollars the other one's five and um, so if you can you know, check that out and consider supporting me that'd be great also uh, put a lot of these paintings up on Etsy to sell however I think in this uh, time you know with everything going on um, purchasing art is kind of the last thing on a lot of people's lists which I completely understand this is um this is isn't my full-time job i'm a school teacher i teach math and physics but um this is like my full-time hobby and i paint every day i'm also certified to teach art but when are you, when are you ever going to find an art opening that'd be so great they look at my resume and be like oh you can do math and physics that'd be great we need a math and physics teacher and they're like oh no Oh, and then there's also links to my Twitter and all this other stuff. So, um, you know, please like, subscribe, comment, etc. I guess you guys know the drill at this point. So, on I think the previous video, somebody asked me to talk a little bit more about the paints that I'm using. Um, I kind of jump into it blindly. Like, I kind of have an idea of what paints I might use. And then I might switch up during a painting. So, if that happens, I'm going to try to clarify what I'm using. Uh, and whenever I put paints on the palette, I'm going to try to show you what brand and whatnot. And I have all my paints right here, so they should be readily accessible, and that shouldn't cause too much of a delay. For example, I'm reapplying some Burnt Umber from Da Vinci brand. And I purchased that because of the size of the tube and um, the price per, uh, I think it's milliliters that it's sold in. I teach, um, my, my, my degree is in math and I teach a uh, financial math class. Never taken a financial business math in my life, but, um, you know, so I try to learn all those concepts and this is just a price per unit concept where you take the price and you divide it by the number of units, the number of milliliters and ounces, it lets you know how much it is per ounce and it lets you compare it to other items. This is Da Vinci brand, um, ultramarine. I believe I had purchased this mainly because I use so much ultramarine. It's often getting refilled every time I paint. Um, it's almost a very like an integral part of my palette. Uh, what else do I need more of on the palette? And that'll give me time to talk to you all about that. Almost every painting will incorporate raw sienna, unless I'm doing kind of a triad or two-tone thing 
or something with a sap green and Venetian red. And once again, that was because it's a, a workhorse for me, the paint, and um, the price per quantity was worth it. Uh, anything else we need to refill on here? If there's anything else we need to refill, I'll talk about it as we get to it. Um, so what I did was I soaked this paper with a um, hake brush. This is a medium hake. I arranged the camera so you can hopefully see more mixing on this one. And we'll get into it. And I'll talk about those uh, paints throughout. I'll try to address that. <clears throat> Okay, so nothing set in stone planned composition-wise. However, Hudson River Valley School is one of my favorite landscape uh, groups of all time, the 1800s paintings and the tonalist group that happened after that. And then the modern tonalists that are taking place now. That's just what I absolutely love. And I've been studying Hudson River Valley in depth and doing sketches from the masters and then trying to analyze what's taking place. And they were oil painters for the most part. I'm trying to think of how I could carry that over to watercolor. So one thing that I noticed, and I talked about this in the previous video, and this is raw sienna. I'm just kind of doing wet and wet. I noticed that um, a lot of them, unless they were going for a dramatic sky, they had just very light, soft, uh, blue skies, minimal clouds, etc. And um, I think that was part of the the school movement itself. The um, beautiful sunny day, being out and about, um, taking in everything and the wonder of the um, of the area of the region. That is one of the cats uh, wanting to get into the art room. And probably every video they'll have a comment saying that they are not allowed in the art room just yet as it's not completely ready for them. This is a Venetian red. Um, I kind of put it in place of the light red and the reason I have it is that um, I use that with a kind of a two uh, color palette with sap green. And that's kind of based off of um, oil painting styles from um, Dennis Sheehan and uh, Stuart Davies. That's why I have the, the Venetian red. But the light red oxide should um, work just as well with this. So I'll often kind of interchange the two. I think it's the same pigment, just I don't know if they cook it differently or change the opacity or something. But it's like the um, the synthetic. I think it's the rust uh, pigment or one. Okay, a little bit of ultramarine mixed into this. And into that. I'm going to mix a little bit of Payne's Gray to darken that up a little bit more and kind of just um, a little bit of darkness in one of these quarters. Add some left to right variety in the sky. Let's darken this corner a little bit more. Uh, here as well, I'm going to squeeze a little bit of water out of the brush, grab a little bit of Payne's Gray, and try to feed some more uh, just pure pigment in here as um, little clouds. Seems as though it's drying uh, pretty fast in that location. I think today it's going to get up to 80 degrees in Louisiana. 80 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm 
Okay. Now with the sky, if you wanted to, and if you're following along, oh, once again, you know, please feel free to follow along. And if there's stuff that you um, you do, I'd love to see your results. You can take this guy and soften, put a little white fluffy textures in the sky. Just add a little bit of movement. Now, um, I've been playing with these landscapes that have a lot of depth into them. Uh, yesterday's, I start my furthest with a little bit of ultramarine and the light red. Yesterday I had quite a tonal shift with the drying so I'm thinking that we might concentrate the pigment load in this um, far background a little bit more or we might come in later on with a light wash to see after we dry. So this will be the furthest one out there. I'm going to put it relatively high horizon line on the paper. And this could be done as a far mountain range, a far um, distant plain, a far row of trees, anything like that. Then I can warm it up a little bit with um, some Burnt Sienna. Now the Burnt Sienna is also a Da Vinci brand. Um, with Earth Tones, I read that you, you can often go the cheaper route and buy cheaper brands for Earth Tones. Um, but I often find that with the more professional brands, the Earth Tones are often uh, cheap compared to the professional brands other colors. So, um, I've done that. Also, I read that, so staying within a brand because the brand makes them in a certain way to interact with one another, like, or at least work with each other and balance a certain way. Meaning that a yellow raw sienna and burnt sienna from one will work in a certain direction as opposed to another brand, which, um, might have a different color slightly. I don't know if that makes sense. I apologize if it doesn't. Um, this is just concentrating the pigment load some more. I'm using the hake to feed in some variety into this. Now here, I've been putting in um, water, been inspired by the Hudson River Valley School um, of having some sort of water um, at, in the far distance. So it's just another layer here. Then I'm going to build this up as if it's kind of going through and back. I could raw sienna to get a little bit more variation right there. We may have to put a line of trees right here. And this is still far, far distance. Um, mixing the raw sienna into this mixture I'm on the purple side. I'm trying to push it more towards a greenish. It doesn't seem to be wanting to happen. Maybe mix some thalo blue in. Thalo blue, the tube that I was using broke. I'm not quite sure what brand it is. I believe it's the um, Van Gogh brand, the thalo blue. Okay, so here's some concepts of trees along this, along this edge. Uh, 
little too much pattern taking place, so need to switch the verticals. We'll have to come in and feed some darks in there. You can do a group of trees up here. Let's take some um, Payne's Gray. I'm gonna have to start another mixing spot since I'm just getting that same tone. Putting that in for variety. And we could soften these guys to get the variety as well. And we could potentially, let's see if we're dry enough to scrape up. No. It's just um, the scraping that gives that backfill to take place. <clears throat> so I could come in there with rigor in a bit and add some um, trunks and whatnot. Okay, let me get another layer. And when I say layer, um, kind of referring to the foreground, midground, background, etc. You're just layering hills and fields. This is, um, Raw sienna. And what I'm going to do is make this a field. I'm going to try to contour this. And one mistake that I feel like I made in a previous one or in general is keeping, and this is something that I've talked about in the past that I know I need, um, you need to keep watch out for, is the vertical the measurement here, you don't want to make, uh, mimic that same measurement. See, this is nice and thin compared to that. This guy, I'm going to have to bring it down more just to get some variety. Or instead of having <clears throat> perfect strips going across, come here and then have a bluff overlooking right here and breaking up that um, composition. You can feed burnt sienna into this. You can even take paper towel while well, this is all wet and almost wipe out a path as if this is a path leading down to uh, the water. <clears throat> Sorry little froggy. Just dip that in water to help fill it up. And there you go. So don't ever let people say that you can't correct a watercolor painting or adjust things. Let's look at that bluff that I was talking about, put it right here. Uh, I feel like it's going to be darker. So this is burnt sienna ultramarine. way too much ultramarine there, but we'll switch that up in a bit. So there's kind of a bluff. Paint is gray. this. 
So as if we're looking down off the edge of this, over this field that goes to a tree line, that goes to water, that goes to a far distant path. And to kind of help this area pop forward, let's scrape some rocks. And then here we'll have a tree mass. Now this tree mass uh, serves the purpose of stopping the eye from going off the page. Um, Payne's gray onto that side to darken that back side. Pain's great to kind of round it. Add some interesting curves. So it serves it to block the eye. And due to that size, and as we get more um, potential clarity with it, because we haven't done any drying whatsoever yet, that um, will help this whole piece push forward towards us. We could also do a second mass of bushes right on this edge might even grow a tree out of this one we're just trying to vary direction and whatnot that's taking place here Dab. Okay, so yeah, this is pretty much almost dry. Okay, so let's um. Let's do a dry off since we're at that point where everything's kind of wanting to dry anyway. relatively dry. Uh, where is my rigor brush? There it is. So you see how we have this softness back here. Um, we could have dried off and then put this area in here and it would have been a little bit more crisp. Um, that's I think a matter of style preference and also a matter of atmospheric effect. I feel like this gives the um, like an end of the day almost a heat feeling like a air effect. Anyway, let me um, work on this line right in this area. Let's um, mix a little lemon yellow with ultramarine blue and see what type of green we can get. And I can Start modeling some shapes in here. All 
um, pans gray. For the darks below. Kind of light wash sideways for almost the shadows that this might cast. You grab those darks. Get a little bit of trunks. Um, phthalo blue, raw sienna. Let's see if we get more of a green. Excuse me. All right, now um, I'm going to take Payne's Gray for a few things. I'm going to add the underside of these rocks. And shadows. I'm also going to mix that with that thalo blue greenish mixture and add some dark contour marks here. And get the dark. Under shadows within these trees, kind of blend the shadow and the dark of the tree together. Get those masses working. Grab the hake. See if I can grab a little bit of um, raw sienna. And then we'll come back and put some uh, branches and stuff into this. Just texturing it up. All right. So now here we're going to have a close tree structure. I'm going to use the hake for this. Let me mix burnt umber and ultramarine now you can use whatever brush you want here I'm just using it um, for time's sake where I'm letting it get to a chiseled point and I'm going to come up Here. And I'll probably come over it with the hake, but I'm just getting my masses down. Oh, sorry, with the rigor. And this one's off the page, but remember we want to paint off the page. Okay, now we go back to the rigor, Payne's gray, we're going to 
one side to kind of darken it. Then I'm gonna shape this, let it grow around this rock. Putting some breaks in this for foliage. And that's off the page, but it is to help widen this scene. This, I can come over here and put some branch uh, trunks in as well. Okay, now lately I've been starting with the raw sienna dry brush uh, stippling for overall form. Um, thing we harp on that I've been harping on from what I feel like I'm learning from the old masters is that the outer edge, first of all, you, you want to have a variety in the shape. You don't want to have uh, lollipop trees. Second, at the edges of the tree, it's going to be the thinnest and you're going to have more light passing through it. So it's going to be a lighter tone. Where at the center of the tree, you could have some super dark um, values. So let's. Um, Make this our pattern. We could have some undergrowth, which we're going to build upon. Uh, now I'm going to get some burnt sienna. I could also take the Venetian red here, and this adds a little bit of variety in this glow. And now I need to darken it up. Um, I'm going to take the thallo blue, mix that with the raw sienna. This kind of gives us a little bit of a green. And in the past, I tried to um, stipple this whole thing and dry between stages so that I didn't affect the previous uh, stippling. But on the last one, and maybe the one before that, I started blending everything to get a little bit more towards the um, inside to prevent, to give more density to the trees. And I'll show you what I mean by that in a second. Okay, now let's darken this up a little bit more. So we have that thalo blue raw sienna. Let's add burnt umber. I'm just gonna add Payne's gray. And what I mean is here, because of those holes in the, the, the you can see the sky, it kind of just takes away a lot of the density. But if I go over that, kind of blend that all in and make that darker in value and we get rid of those lights that helps I think build up the depth right there and make it seem like there's a lot more taking place you know like stretching towards us you'll have darks on the other underside of some things so you think about that and I left this opening here which was deliberate Now I'm going to get almost pure burnt, um, not burnt, uh, Payne's Gray. My Payne's Gray, I don't know if I mentioned it, I think that's also a Da Vinci brand as well. So I think almost all the paints I'm using right now are Da Vinci brand. A little bit of Van Gogh within the um, Fallow Blue. And I think the alizarin on my palette is Cotman, but I didn't use any alizarin in this painting. 
the lemon yellow is cotton as well, but I don't think we really got much of a use out of it. I just, um, I'm almost thinking that I'm eventually take lemon yellow out the palette because I just really don't use it that often or I need to experiment with it more. Something has to happen. Okay. Now, within these masses, while it's still wet, you can scrape branches. You can add, let me fix this guy up a little bit. So you can scrape branches and you can also add branches in here. Another thing I harp upon in the videos is that you don't have to just put in straight black or Payne's gray or dark for branches. If we want, we can get a lighter wash and that might allow us to think that um, it's catching more light or that it's receding within the paper in the scene. I personally really enjoy adding kind of depth right here, uh, not depth, uh, kind of almost a wall of um, small trees and whatnot coming up. That comes from um, like the being in the swamp, the bayou, you know, Louisiana, where we have so much of that, just uh, vines and overgrowth taking place. You can even let light trunks come up. I think I'm gonna have to darken this ground immensely. So this is just Payne's Gray. I'm just using the rigor on its side for a little bit of variety and texture in there does have this rock that we scraped in. We might have to darken some spots. Payne's gray. We can use it just dry brush texture, just go in different directions. Foreground, it's rocky, it's um that's the effect you're gonna have there. That's what you're gonna feel. You don't wanna walk on this without shoes. And you could have fun, this is where um, your own style can really start to play out and the rigor marks that you make. We often refer to that as like a calligraphy type stroke, uh, the rigor work. And I could play down here, I could scratch more rocks. I'll scratch them lighter so that it's just more of that like kind of grayish tone to them. And you can put grass. And if we wanted, we could put flowers in. Maybe that's what we'll do as this one um, experiment with. It won't be an experiment at this point because we've done it before, but experiment with this composition and see how it works. Um, taking the razor blade and um, pulling out some um, highlights, flowers. Payne's gray. As a homework assignment for y'all, if you made it this far in the video, of course you're always welcome to follow along, like I said, but I want you to look at some of the Hudson River Valley painters and I want you to zoom in on their trees and I want you to look at their dark masses, their greenish, masses and then the edges okay so do a little bit of um study in that
All right. Um, a little bit of dark back here. I think one of the cats is getting disciplined for almost knocking over water in the other room, apparently. So I don't know if that's showing up in video, but that's apparently what's taking place. The cats are quite silly. I never had cats before. Um, I never had... Um, we had a bird and we had um, a lizard when I was a kid. So my allergies. But then once... well. A few years later, after I went to college and whatnot, then my family got a dog. So, you know, I wanted one my whole life as a little kid, but with my allergies, it was so bad. If my parents are watching this, because they do watch these videos, um, don't don't feel bad about that, but <laughs> I'm just like throwing that out there for everybody. My parents aren't bad parents at all. They just, you know, they really took care of me with my asthma and allergies. But I've been doing... um the allergy shots now and I can actually be around furry animals. When they did the allergy test, they um they do it based off of like wherever you're at, I think. Like in for me, Louisiana. So like oak trees, all those type of things are on the list and uh the weeds that are common down here. They circled every type of tree on the list, every type of weed, every type of grass. Pretty much wasn't allergic to a few different molds, penicillin, cockroaches, and flowers. Uh, not flowers, feathers. Those were the uh, things that I was not allergic to. So it was just like, well, that makes sense why my sinuses are terrible all the time. But the allergy shot's been working great. So if you have those issues, I recommend considering allergy shots. I mean, they've been working wonders for me. All right, so that's me blabbing while I was painting. Um, the one thing that I'd like y'all's feedback on is how this reads for you. Does this read as a cloud or does this read as far distant land? I could right now uh, contour it better and, um, and make it a little bit more crisp which um, maybe you'll look at it here see what you think and then I'll, I'll do that uh, with the last one that I did I put boats back in here to help this read as water but let's uh, let's do that experiment so you see it the way how it is now right maybe y'all can um, give me feedback let me uh, Wipe it back. I'm just gonna use very watered down wash. That's ultramarine, Venetian red, just to get a purple. And let's put this line in. We may not even need to um, affect the rest of this. We'll see how this crisping of that edge. Maybe we could add a little bit of burnt sienna. A little bit, just to warm it up. This is the far line. Let's darken that up a little bit. Okay, so let me know what you think of that. We'll see how it dries, but um, give me your opinion if that helped 
that or if it took away an effect. So that's where we're at right now. It still has a little bit more to dry. Um, to make this interesting, we could put a fence in, we could put people in, we could put, um, okay, we could put little houses down in here if we wanted to. Um, let me see if I have a piece of paper. Yes, I do. When I was cleaning the art room, I made sure to have a piece of paper in this desk. I'm gonna take this rigger with a wash. We'll see. So it looks a little doggish, but I do have a book right here, and I opened it up last time, and then I, um, I got a little scared about trying it out. It's something that I need to, um, I need to do. I need to add something in this region. It has to happen. Um, somebody walking, or, or cows. And I think it's time that we, uh, we bite the bullet. And do a cow. So I'm just gonna um, look at some random cows and see if I can um, sketch one out. I've been doing them in the pen and ink drawings where we, um, I, I would pretty much just contour the cow because um, they're, they're often very small here. And They're very integral in Hudson River Valley paintings. Um, it shows the domestication of the land. It also shows um, the time of day, whether the cows are coming back in from pasture or if they're going out to pasture. It also um, you know, just adds a potential element in those spots. So let's mix, we got this gray wash. They're gonna have to be really small. The shadows will help the picture read a little bit. And what might have to take place is that there would just be a whole bunch of them. And so the form isn't perfect, but they, um, the grouping will allow it to read as such. So in Hudson River Valley painting cows, they allow the, um, like I said, domestication, time of day. They give you an idea of that. And then on the reverse side, they would often have, um, what's it called? Um, deer. And the deer would give you the idea of um, the wilderness. So you'd have people, cows, um, domestication, time of day, things like that, um, and deer, wilderness. Kind of letting some of these guys just lay down. This book isn't really going to help me out that much at this moment. I think I have a plan in place. Kind of just if you put a few gestural ideas.
And it might be that um, with this style of painting, fast and loose, and just the size of these, that one of them that would maybe read as a cow would help the rest of them read better. And the other ones could just be kind of blobs and laying down and whatnot. So they have cows that would be next to each other and blend in and whatnot. We could add, what would it be? Um, the burnt sienna for some of the colors of the cows. Feed that in. You wouldn't pick up too much of the color of the cow. They'd be more, like I said, blobs. Glad that I'm biting the bullet and trying this. I think we have some cows taking place. All right, and we'll give it a name like Cows in the Valley or something, something cool like that. All right, let me dry it off, and we'll sign it, and we'll call it a day. drying off now that we had finally took that leap into um, cow shapes down the line a small silhouetted tree with the shadow hanging over them or partially would be kind of interesting so I noticed you know when I drive out and about you know in Louisiana in the town I'm in there's a lot of um, you know cows and pastures and you see how they'll congregate underneath trees during different times of day so here's the finished product i hope you enjoyed and i will speak to you all soon have a great day